here with Mark Johnson from KOA. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for joining us. You've been happy to be here. To start off, you've been with the broadcast side of the bus since 2004. Mm -hmm. Given the turmoil of the football and basketball programs over the past three years, do you think the ship has been righted? That's kind of a broad question. Uh, and at this point, I think I need some combat pay for what I've gone through the last right. seven years. I mean, this, is, this has not been you know, a real highlight or high uh, period for the Buffaloes from mm -hmm. a competitive standpoint. Uh, you know, I think back just a few years ago, it was the Dan Hawkins' second year when they won, what, two games? Basketball won seven. I think right. I was the only BCS announcer in the country that did not call ten victories combined in the two sports. So, obviously, this is kind of a dark period for Colorado right. athletics. And so, to, you know, to, to answer if, if it's, the ship has been righted, I, I think it's a little bit uh, – a little uncertain at this point in time. I like what I'm seeing from basketball. I think Tad Boyle's doing a nice job. Obviously, there's some great talent there with Alec Burks and, and Corey Higgins. It appears to be going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I think the crowds we've seen at the Coors Events and Conference Center indicate there's excitement behind it. And then when you look at football, you know, I guess we'll, we'll see what happens you know, when they make that transition to the Pac-12 next year. Uh, there's obviously great excitement with John Embry and Eric Bieniemy and Greg Brown and, and all these former buffs coming back. Canavis McGee, of course, being on the staff. And, and so I think there's good forward momentum, what they did from a recruiting standpoint with 13 right. contact days, I think, uh, was a nice step in the right direction. But, you know, they, they always say about recruiting classes, you don't know for about two or three years. And, and I guess the, the long answer to short question is we won't know for about two or three years right. whether from an athletic department standpoint things have kind of turned because it's, it's been rough here over the, obviously the last six, seven years. Well, you mentioned Hawkins. And as far as Hawkins was concerned, do you think he deserved the criticism that he got given the fact that he took a program that was more famous for the police bar and things that were happening off the field, mm. and he turned it into a clean program, just unfortunately it just didn't turn into wins on the field. Well, and I know, and listen, that's something we all like to talk about. Mm -hmm. I mean, within our athletic programs, we, we like clean programs. We like, you know, young people graduating. We like young people not getting in trouble with right. the law. But I'll guarantee you right now in Auburn, Alabama, they're talking about a championship. Well, what transpired off the field is not being discussed. And that, that's the stark reality of college athletics. I mean, th this isn't a try-hard league. It's a do-well league, mm -hmm. essentially. And, and, you know, that's a bit of a playoff of Hawkins, you know, it's the Big 12. But, but you know, that's the truth of the matter. Uh, did he deserve to get fired? You're hired to win college football games. He did not win enough. And so, yes, the answer is yes. Did he do some nice things in terms of trying to reshape the product? Yes, he did some very nice things in that regard. So uh, it's, there, there's a starkness to this business, though, and, and, and that's why these, these men and women who do what, you know, what Hawk did for a living, they get paid a lot of money, and the bottom line is the bottom line. And, you know, quite frankly, he didn't you know, elevate the bottom line. Well, you mentioned Coach Embry there. I mean, what do you think uh, John Embry has to do to be successful going into the Pac-12 next season? Well, I think the first thing he's got to do, uh, he's got to recruit. Mm -hmm. and, and I made reference to that a while ago. You know, they, they had 13 contact days from the time that, that he got on campus to the time that he re recruited his staff and put them together, and then those gentlemen then got out on the road. He had 13 contact days to really go out and get your hands on kids and, and talk to their parents and try and sell, sell the program. That's what he's got to do. Now he's got to do it for a 12-month calendar year. You mm -hmm. know, they've already gotten a commitment for the you know, 2012 recruiting class. That is going to be the, the most important thing that he's able to do. He's already got... You know, really from the Buff family behind him. There's great emotion behind him. Uh, you know, I've kind of joked at times, it's kind of like, kind of like been getting the band back together. There's so many guys with Colorado connections. And so there's a good feeling behind this. Now John's got to go out and get, you know, there's that old cliche in sports, it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmy and Joe's. He's got to get the Jimmy and Joe's now mm -hmm. to put a product in the field. Because, you know, Paul, when I look at, at where this program has been since I've been here over the last seven years, um, when you just look at the eye test on the field, Colorado has not measured up. When you compare them to Texas or, or Oklahoma or, in some cases, Nebraska or Oklahoma State, they haven't had the same caliber of athlete. And I guess the, the proof is in the pudding when it comes to the NFL draft. Right. You, know, you haven't seen as many buffs getting drafted, and that's the ultimate determiner whether you've got you know, high-caliber talent. Well, you said, speaking of the recruits, though, what do you think of the new recruits coming in? Uh, I mean, they're basically around a three-star or below. Sure. But there looks like there's some good prospect in there. What's your kind of take on, on the new, the new well, people coming in? Uh, again, we'll, we'll see the way they develop. Um, you know, Victor Rogers, who does sidelines uh, with us in 850K away for football games, um, 
you know, All-American linemen for the Buffs. Last time they had a truly great team in 2001 when they won the Big 12 championship and nearly played for a national championship. He made an observation to me one time. He said the problem that he saw up front in particular, where football games are won, is Colorado has gone out and recruited projects. Right. They recruited six foot four, 230-pound offensive linemen and hoped that they grow in. Right. Now, as we know with Nate Solder, that happens every now and again. Started out as a tight end. Right. The, the problem becomes is you miss more than you hit in that scenario. And so Victor's observation was they've got to go out and recruit big bodies like he is, like Ryan Miller is, a current, current Colorado Buffalo, and then allow those guys to mature when they've already got the size. Mm -hmm. When I look at this recruiting class, I see big bodies up front. The young man that they picked up from, from here in Colorado, offensive lineman, 280, 285 pounds. The center they got, 295 pounds. They're big bodies. And, and so there's the young man, the Nembot kid, uh, who they brought in defensive end, 6'8", 270. So the raw material looks good, and the 40 times look good. But again, we'll, we'll see how they develop once they get here. What do you th how do you think that's going to translate into the Pac-12? Because it's a different style of football from the yeah, Big 12. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a more of a, a finesse league, and you've got some coaches, obviously, with John Embry, with Eric Bieniemy, who both spent time at UCLA. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg Brown comes in from Arizona most recently as their co-defensive coordinator. So those guys have a sense of what that league's all about. Right. Uh, it's a bit more of a finesse league. And, and, and quite frankly, when you compare it to the SEC, when you compare it to what we've seen in the Big 12, nobody plays defense, relatively speaking. Right. And so the Buffs are going to have to get faster. They're going to have to get bigger up front. And definitely on the defensive end, get some speed on the back end of that defense. So when you look at the raw numbers of what they brought in, you know, they, they look good at this point in time. But, you know, former uh, Purdue coach Joe Tiller years ago when I was there said the amazing thing about recruits are, when they cross the state line, when they're coming to college, they shrink two inches and gain two tenths in their 40 time. And so, you right. know, what what you see on paper, what the recruiting services say is one thing. The reality becomes, you know, something else once they get here. But so far, again, and we're, we're, we're looking ahead, kind of looking into the crystal ball, everything appears to be going in the right direction. Well, turning the focus to men's basketball, what was your expectations at the beginning of the season? And do you feel this team has or has not met those expectations? Well, I, I tempered a little bit because I assumed that Shane Harris Tunks was going to be available for this team. Because right. the one, let's be honest about it, they're a bit of a donut. I mean, they've got wonderful players around the perimeter and they have a hole inside. And so I, I thought he would be available. Uh, and even with Shane uh, you know, being in the lineup, I figured probably 18, 19 wins. They're on pace for that at this point in time. Uh, that's why I think Tad Boyle's done some great things. Right. Uh, they've got some wonderful perimeter talent, obviously. Alec Burks is, is a lottery pick. Uh, hopefully he sticks around you know, one more year to play for Colorado. Right. Uh, Corey Higgins is. Uh, I think Nate Tomlinson's done a nice job with the points. So they're, they're very solid. Marcus Rell for another guy. Uh, Levi Knutson, obviously, is having his best year of his career. So they've done a nice job, but they still got that hole inside that they try and cover up with, with different schemes and, and how they approach things. Uh, but but ultimately, that's where they get hurt sometimes is inside. Well, is it that hole inside that's stopping them from being a tournament team, in your opinion? Well, I, at this point, I'm not willing to say that they're not a tournament team. Okay. You know, you look at the, the schedule they've got down to stretch here, and obviously coming up this weekend. It's going to be tough. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. You've got Kansas on the road. You've got to go to Allen Fieldhouse. You've got a top five team in Texas coming in here. Right. Very difficult circumstances there. You're on the road against Iowa State, Nebraska at home, and then on the road against Texas Tech. That's the five games they got remaining. If you win three of those, you're in that 19 range. If you're able to sneak out a couple in the Big 12 Conference Tournament, you've got a chance then. Mm -hmm. But they've got to come up with a couple of road victories and build that resume once again. At this point in time, you've got a Missouri win. You've got two K-State wins. Again, those have, have not looked as good as the season's gone on, although Kansas State helped the Buffaloes here the other night with a win over Kansas. And so the resume right now is still in the gray area. They've still got a chance, but, but they've got some work to do. Right. Well, switching gears a little bit, um, A.J. Green, wide receiver from Georgia that we mm -hmm. played last year in football, he was suspended this, uh, the past season for selling his jersey, yet universities make millions of dollars off of the merchandising of players. Do you think we have entered an era where the haves and have-nots are so great that it's time to start playing athletes a stipend? You know, the problem with that is, and my, my initial response is, yes, they need something. But, but the problem with that becomes the slippery slope aspect of it um, because you're, you are correct. I mean, when, when you start talking about the football factories in this country, tech, whether it's Texas or Michigan or, or whomever, the amount of money those institutions make mm -hmm. off of those athletes right. is, is off the charts. Uh, there has to be something because ultimately when you look at what these kids are asked to do in college, it's, it's a full-time job on top of going to school. Right.
they bring great notoriety to an institution. They're the value uh, on you know those about three or four 60 second ads that you get on ABC on a Saturday afternoon are priceless for the institution and do great things in terms of drawing students and bringing accolades and, and notoriety to an institution. And so they are doing a great service for the school. They need to get something in return. And I'm, I'm not saying they need, you know, when it's all said and done for on their way out the door, hand them a check for $100,000. That's not what I'm talking about. But because they're unable to go out and make a couple of bucks to go out with their friends on a Saturday night or whatever it might be, there has to be something. And, and I don't know that I've got the answer for it. I just know the way the system is set up right now, they're being cheated in some respects and, and held back a little bit from a social standpoint, which is part of what college is supposed to be about. Well, let me pick your brain then up for a little bit. So if I can make you the head of the NCA right now. All right. What are the well, I wish you had that power. <laughs> what are the top three things that you would change instantly? Hmm. Uh, n number one uh, would, would be a college football playoff. I, I think that needs to happen. Uh, it's always been a hollow argument to me when they say, you know, the number one thing you hear is we can't have a college football playoff because kids are going to miss class. Right. Well, uh, I was with Syracuse University back in 2003 when they won the national championship uh, with Carmelo Anthony and Jerry McNamara and that group. Uh, I believe, if memory serves, we were on the road 28 out of 35 days during the spring semester. A college football playoff would take place during the semester break for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it's not like these student athletes would be missing a great deal of class time. That would be number one. Number two would be the issue we just talked about, and that is allowing the students to have something. And I'm not talking about a huge sum of money here. It may be you know, $100 a month or just something so they have you know, opportunity to go out and act, uh, be active socially. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be number one. Uh, and, and number two would be a little bit like we see in the National Football League of leveling the playing field in some form or fashion. And, and I haven't, you know, thought in great depth on how you might do that. But I, I, you, you made reference to the haves and have-nots a while ago. That's becoming an enormous issue, which is why I think the move to the Pac-12 for Colorado is better because in the Big 12, in particular the Big 12 South, it's become an arms race. And right. the Buffalo simply could not, uh, you know, maintain the position that they were or even try to maintain a position with Texas and Oklahoma and, and some of these schools. And so there's got to be some way to level that playing field a little bit. And so I think that would be number three. Well, being a fellow journalist yourself, our school of journalism is going to be closing or it's going to be melding into something mm -hmm. different. Here at CU, does that worry you about the state of journalism as far as in our universities? Well, I, I think it does. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, I was at Syracuse and I was an adjunct professor at the Newhouse School. Mm -hmm. And if you're involved in sports casting, you know the names that have come out of there. I mean, you know, Bob Costas and Marv Albert and uh, Mike Tirico and Monday Night Football, and, and it just goes on and on and on. I think it's important to have this kind of training ground so people can sit in the chair like you are and conduct these interviews. And the crew that's behind the cameras can do what they're doing to learn the business in some form or fashion. There's no greater learning tool in this business than just being there. You know, I, I, don't, I don't care how many theoretical classes you can take or how many books you read, you never fully learn what, what we're doing right here until you're sitting behind those cameras or, or behind a microphone. And, and I think not having this opportunity then hurts the business that I'm in right now uh, down the road. Um, when I was at Syracuse, there, there was great opportunity for kids to be on the air, do ball games, do different types of shows. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't simulate that any other way than just doing it. So it hurts from the entry level standpoint. When people graduate then, men and women graduate from college, what do they have to offer me when they come to me as a sports director at KOA? Well, you can talk about the theories and the classes and the papers you wrote. That doesn't mean much to me at that point when I'm looking at putting you on TV or putting you on radio. And so I think that there is, there is a shortcoming happening there if these kind of programs disappear. So what advice then with, uh, with a graduating journalism student mm -hmm. or somebody coming in from journalism, what would you say to them, what type of advice would you give to them is probably the most important thing coming out of school? Well, I think it's important, number one, uh, to find internships. You've got to have that opportunity to get in the middle of this world and experience it in some form or fashion. Uh, you've got to be able to do that. One thing I did coming out of while I was in college, I was bugging every uh, sports director and news director and program director right. I could find, trying to find opportunity just to get my foot in the door someplace. You've got to be able to get there. You know, we've had kids that have come through KOA, for example, as, as interns. And although I couldn't offer them a position, I liked what I saw. I, I saw the talent. I saw the initiative. I, I saw the love for the business mm -hmm. of broadcasting. And, and so, you know, I, I might steer them in a certain direction, make a phone call to help them out, because I think that's important. You've got to, again, you've got to get your hands on. 
you got to get your hands on this business a little bit, and there's only one way to do that. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with me today. Is there a way that people can follow you? Are you on Twitter? Can What's yeah. your Twitter account? Yeah, I believe an old guy like me has actually figured uh, Twitter out. So, okay. yeah, you can go mjohnson850koa. And uh, whatever's on my mind, a lot of buff stuff, obviously, right. but whatever's on my mind about the world of sports we get to on there. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with me.